Love me tender, love me sweet, never let me go. You have made my life complete, and I love you so. Hello, welcome to A+. Plus. You might not have recognized the voice immediately, but of course you recognize the face. We welcome Julie Andrews. Hello. Um, you didn't want people to say, ah, oh, there's Julie Andrews, did you, in the voice? No, it's a, it's a voice I don't use very often, which is a very low, comfortable place to sing. And uh, I hope people don't recognize it at first. It would be, it would be nice. No, it comes from a new album called Love Me Tender. Yes. All country and western songs? Yes, um, nearly all. I'd say they're sort of middle of the road country and western songs because there are a few songs on there that really aren't country, but they're close. Now, why did you want to suddenly do this kind of thing? It's, or is it not that sudden? It, it, it isn't, it isn't uh, that uh, um, unbelievable. It, it's a very simple answer, and it is that I love to record, and I don't do it often enough. And if I do record as a rule, it's usually uh, recording something that has a character in front of it, like uh, Mary Poppins or Maria von Trapp, and so I never get to record mm -hmm. as myself. And I love recording. It's something you can do privately, quietly, and then release it later when you're pleased with it, hopefully. And um, when I was sort of uh, talking to Blake about it one day, he said, well, why don't you go ahead and try it and do it? If you Blake, record. your husband? My husband, yes. And uh, he thought at the time that country music might sit very well on my voice, which is not an easy voice to, um, uh, it doesn't sing uh, popular or modern music that easily. It doesn't adapt to it that easily. And he felt that country music would be good. So I went down to Nashville and uh, uh, found a wonderful producer called Larry Butler. And he just literally uh, uh, spent a lot of time with me and the album is the result. Before we talk about Nashville, is it the quality of the voice that you feel wouldn't adapt that easily to, say, pop or rock songs, or the actual vowel sounds, which are still so essentially English? I think it's, I think it's both. Um, I have a very sort of uh, clear voice, and, and, and a sort of almost white and thin in a way. And um, also, my diction is so crisp, I have to sing songs with a very good lyric. I can't just sort of... Uh, Ad lib. Uh, um, I, I once sang a song, a beautiful song with a wonderful melody called Feelings, and it goes feelings, and then it goes oh whoa whoa feelings, and suddenly <laughs> I wasn't singing it very well at all because it just didn't sit well on, on me, much as I love the song. So you went to Nashville hoping what that the atmosphere, the actual technique within the recording studio, would transmute the voice into something slightly new? What? Well, it is a voice, the, the, the low voice that I use on the album is a voice that I'm using more and more. And so I did know that I had that to, to draw on. A huskiness. A quiet voice and a very low voice, um, which is very pleasant for me to use because it's very easy. It seems to, that my, my, I don't have to uh, uh, aim for high notes or a certain kind of purity, it just kind of is. And uh, Nashville, of course, is the mother load of, of uh, country music. And since Larry Butler, the producer, lived in Nashville and he said, come on down, that's exactly what I did. But I'm wondering if just walking around the streets of Nashville does something to you in your interpretation of their storytelling songs, aren't they? Western yes, they songs? are. And they're very much from the heart. They may sound a little um, hokey or sentimental, but they're not when you're there. Mm -hmm. uh, they, re they really come. People are not ashamed to say or to sing what they're feeling. And um, yes, I guess I did absorb a lot while I was down there. I certainly listened to so much music while I was down there that... What, uh, live music? Mean? No, no, I, I just listened to an enormous amount of country music records and things like that. I, I kind of... Uh, it was Larry's idea that I should just immerse myself in it mm. for a good three or four days and that we should then pick songs from that. No. The funny thing is, people, well, somebody like me, you think of walking into a studio and knocking off an album in a day. You said three or four days. Surely it takes longer than that. Oh, that was just the uh, preliminary work. It didn't take as long as you would imagine, because country music is very much made on the spur of the moment. Uh, there were no orchestrations that were pre-written or anything like that. We literally made music the evening we went in to record which actually was very good for me because I'm much, uh, rather a careful person and this made me 
loosen up. Do you mean that your musicians were sort of ad-libbing, let's see what happens? Yes, uh, we're, we said, we're going to do so-and-so tonight, guys. And uh, one of them said, well, uh, what key? And they said, oh, any old key, what's comfortable? And I said, yeah, but I think that, no, you just sing in our key. And so I did. How terrifying! <laughs> it was very good for me. And uh, then they said, well, I'll play this and you play that and why don't we do a bit here and we'll do another chorus and let's try it. And we'd put one up and try it and then if we didn't like it, we'd do it a little better or something like that. Do you know, after all those years of a very tightly disciplined pit orchestra and Broadway had to mm -hmm. be, and of course in Hollywood, the orchestras are all, it's all pre-recorded. All pre-recorded. Was this the first time in years that you had had fun singing? Uh, I would say... Uh, I always have fun singing, I have to be truthful. It is, it is a joy to be able to sing with an orchestra. But yes, it was the first time I was able to have fun without anybody uh, judging it in any way. I was really doing it for me first, and we were just having fun. Would you like to keep on doing that, sort of flying the way you want to fly? Well, I think anyone's ambition in life, especially as you get older, is to fly as you want to fly uh, in, in many things. But. Uh, I don't suppose it's completely possible. It depends on the nature of the work you're doing. Uh, one always hopes to sort of make it look easy. Mm. Uh, mm. But I think probably if I'm doing a film, it would be hard to fly like that. One would have to pre-record. One would have to do it. And yet you strike me, your whole professional history strikes me as one of somebody who wants to take risks. I uh, think you're right about that. Uh, I do enjoy taking risks. I, I don't like to repeat myself, uh, because that's something I've already tried or done. So I, I think one obviously does eventually repeat oneself because of a certain amount of um, character comes through and, and one does repeat oneself. Well, I would like to suggest to you that another way in which you might be said to have taken risks is that you haven't minded sending up your own film image. <laughs> and I'm thinking about the film SOB, yes. in which you play a Hollywood star with a Hollywood film director husband. And when the film you've made turns out to be a colossal flop, your screen husband hits on the idea of turning it into a porno film, using not only your body, but your money too. And this is your reaction. I must warn you, my hands are lethal weapons. Oh, so is your goddamn fountain pen. I'd better be going. You stay where you are, Cully. You're a witness. You lunatic. You maniac. Sixteen million, Felix. Half of that money is mine. That entitles you to 50% of the profit. That entitles me to have you arrested for grand theft, larceny, fraud, embezzlement, you thieving, filching son of a bitch. Sally Miles! Where's? You're going to give me my eight million or so help me, I'll have you locked up for the rest of your unnatural life. <coughs> give me my money, Felix. Give it to me, or, or I will kill you. Sally Miles kills. Oh. Well, Sally Miles, Julie Andrews, how many times did you have to do that? A few, and it was the best fun. It was the, I, I, it's really one of my favorite films. And it was, it was fun to send myself up. Now, was there any parallel between that fictional film <laughs> and real life? Because your husband, Blake Edwards, was the director, writer of that film. Um, it was the film in which you first appeared topless. Mm -hmm. Now, how did he approach you? I mean, a director could do it to uh, an actress by saying, by incidentally, honey, there's one thing about the <laughs> script. But how did your husband say to you, Julie, I want you to play the part, but? Well, first of all, he was my husband, which helped a lot. And secondly, uh, he, believe it or not, wrote the screenplay about 10 or 12 years before the film ever got produced. Every major motion picture in, in Hollywood, uh, studio in Hollywood turned it down at first, and it took a long time to get it made. So I had 10 or 12 years to think about it. And uh, knowing that it was for Blake and that he would do it in extremely good taste, I really didn't m worry too much on mine. In the best possible taste? Yes, I think it was, because it was very much within the character. It wasn't gratuitous. It was very necessary for that role. And I, I certainly wouldn't do something like that if it were just just exposing oneself. It would That would mm -hmm. be wrong, but it was within the character. The film is an attack upon Hollywood, though. Mm. 
Yes, it is. And, and yes, there are biographical things in it, lots of biographical things in it. Uh, I, Blake drew from our lives, people that he's known, um, people that have passed away, the, the whole sequence at the end with the crazy dead body and, and, and the uh, burial at sea. I think that that's based on a, on a story that's going around Hollywood. How many years did you actually spend in Hollywood? Uh, I guess I was there from the early 60s onwards. Mm -hmm. So it's about 20, 25, 27 years, something like that. Did you ever feel at home there? Yes, I do feel at home. You know, I, I spend a great deal of my time still there because Blake is an American and he works in Hollywood so much. And uh, uh, it, it, it does feel like home. America has been very good to me and very generous. It's just accepted me and embraced me. But do you still feel essentially not English, but European? I mean, your your basic home is now in, I can never say it, Stad? Stad? <laughs> very, very good try. In Switzerland. In Switzerland, yes. That's our sort of real base and our hideaway and where we run to when, when all the hard work's over. Um, I feel, really, I think I am essentially very British. And I feel that, it, it sounds very corny to say so, but when I am away, I really do represent my country so I try very hard to give a good image of the English abroad um, but uh, I feel I guess you could say sort of mid-Atlantic I'm somewhere between the two but Hollywood itself has built up its own reputation for being some kind of destructive entity as if it takes people in and kills them well although the, the piece of film that you just saw might look like it was representing Hollywood in fact it was a great cry from the heart from Blake's heart about uh, say, saying, you know, please let's take this wonderful industry, this beautiful film industry, uh, let's treasure it more, let's not abuse it. He was really tilting at the really big power in Hollywood, not the the sort of uh, gut level Hollywood, which is, uh, in, you know, hard working people who, who love to make movies. And it really, you don't have to be, um, you don't have to be part of a society that, that, that one reads about in the newspapers. We're very private people over there. and. We don't go to all the Hollywood parties and do all the glamour things, only when necessary. But the, um, the star people, uh, the fragile people, the vulnerable people, they seem to be the ones who can be destroyed by too much success too Well, it's, soon. it's, I guess, pretty seductive. And uh, if you're not fairly well rooted in yourself, it probably could topple people and make you uh, disbelieve things. Now, when you say rooted in yourself, that leads to... We know about not just Hollywood, but the sort of California freaky occultism, um, self-observation. Now, I know both you and your husband went through courses of analysis. That's true, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Do you think you would have done that if you'd remained in England? I mean, it's such a common thing to do in America, isn't it? Like going to the dentist. I'm not sure it's that common. Um, it's a very privileged thing to be able to do. Uh, and I, I, I'm very grateful that I was able to do it because I think it's helped me keep on a sort of fairly sane and steady course. But um, who suggested it? I did. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted it. Um, I, Why? Well, I think that uh, there was a time in Hollywood when when everything was going on around me, and I really wanted to. Um, I, I had many questions that needed answers. That's about the best description of it. And uh, and I did find those answers for myself. Also, I think. Uh, that's probably enough said about it, really. Mm. Yes, I know. It's much too intimate. But you must discover things about yourself that surprise you, and uh, you have to come to terms with those surprises. Yes, it, it is It is a hard-working thing that you're doing in analysis. Does it weaken you for a while? I think it's a little like um, tidying up a, a, a very untidy cupboard. And when you start to tidy it and put it right and everything gets thrown on the floor, it's all in mm -hmm. a bit of a jumble. But then you start putting back the pieces that are valid mm -hmm. and it, it's okay again afterwards, one hopes. And the things you're throwing on the floor before you put them back in a, a new place are memories and... No, no, no. I think they're, they're the things you're throwing away, I, I, I hope, are neuroses and garbage and things you don't need to carry around with you all the time. But it is a complicated subject, don't you agree? It's very hard yes. to explain. but did you find... I mean, it seems, again... Reading the facts, you had a very pressurized childhood. Um, you were making well, a living from the time you were ten. Yes, so. yes, it was different. That's for sure. Mm. 
At the time, it didn't feel like it was pressurized. Of course, it never does to any child. No, they think all children are like that. Yes, don't and it's they? only in retrospect that it, it, it probably was a little bit. But but I certainly it certainly gave me some awfully strong um, uh, things to draw from in later life, and, and I'm glad that I did have that early training now. Now we've talked about the risks you've taken. Um, you seem to be constantly trying to destroy the very successful image of the English rose. <laughs> now, why do you detest it so much? I don't. What's the matter with Mary Poppins and the sound <laughs> of music? I, I think I'd better put this to bed once and for all. Uh, there is absolutely nothing wrong with it. And in fact, I would hate to destroy uh, those wonderful... I wouldn't put down those marvellous films for anything because they did give a lot of people a lot of pleasure. And I'm thrilled to have been a part of them, really. Uh, I think all my life I've tried to take risks. The problem is that the media, and therefore, I guess, the mm -hmm. public, and the very films themselves that are successful are so successful that they sort of blot out the other things that one might try to do. And actually, you said it earlier, all my life I've tried to do things that are different, but things like Sound of Music are so popular that that's all people can remember. When you think of someone like... Clark Gable, the first thing you think of is Gone with the Wind, because it was the biggest film, I suppose, that he ever made. But he did other fabulous films, but that's the first one that comes to mind for most people. How does it feel to be not famous, not a celebrity, but truly a star, and to know that you are adored by thousands of people? I know there was a, a lady in Cardiff who saw Sound of Music 334 times. Yes, I heard about that lady. Yes. Yeah, amazing. It's a burden on you, isn't it? I think it can sometimes cause one to feel a little wobbly because there's wobbly. a... Wobbly in the sense that, that, that people are so generous with their affection and you don't want to ever let them down. Mm -hmm. But it's an enormous compliment too. And I, I, I'm thrilled if people feel that way. How do you live with it? practically speaking. Will you see? No, you've been in London for how long? I've been trip? here about uh, eight days so far. And uh, Have you been swamped, swarmed and uh, no, stamped on? People I don't think expect to see me out in the streets and so um, it hasn't been bad at all. Um, and you really can be as private as you want to be uh, as long as you don't go uh, dashing around and uh, showing yourself uh, in nightclubs and things like that or restaurants or whatever and uh, I know nice quiet places to visit. You sound as if you're very disciplined. I think I am. I think all that early training made me very much. So you almost have been? Yes, I think so. Well, uh, probably not in my teens, but, but I grew to be, yes. Now, when you were cruelly, I think, passed over for the film version of My Fair Lady, mm -hmm. and it was given to Audrey Hepburn, that must have been a testing time for every kind of reserve, <laughs> discipline, whatever you want. Well, no I foot stamping yeah. at all? Oh, yes. I used a few very healthy uh, uh, four-letter words, I can assure you. But uh, I really was not a movie star in those days. I did not make films. I was only known on Broadway. And, of course, I could well understand why they would But Audrey it. Hepburn was not a singer, so... No, but she was an Fair enormous Fair. box office star. And I, I do think she did a marvellous job in the film. Did you feel like that then? You know, I understood it better then than I do now. Uh, as the years have gone by, I wish very much that just once I had been able to record that beautiful play uh, for myself. Mm. Um, but at the time, I really did understand. I mean, I, I didn't expect to make films in those days, so, so uh, what came later was a complete wonderful surprise. But you see, uh, what a wonderful, joyous thing it must have been when Walt Disney... Well, he'd never create... Aside from Mickey Mouse, he'd never created a star, <laughs> had he? made you, Mary Poppins, Julie Andrews took over the world. You, part of you must have been saying, oh, I knew I could do it. Well, it was wonderful compensation, that's the best way to put it, for missing How out How polite. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was. I mean, what could be, who could be luckier than that? I mean, uh, to miss out on something, that's one thing, but to then have and something... And then taught something. Well, to have something mm. given back is wonderful. Can I ask, did you and Audrey Hepburn become acquaintances, yes. if not friends? She... And did you discuss it? Yes, we have. In fact, uh, we're good friends. She also lives in Switzerland, and we see each other Isn't quite a bit. Funny. Mm. Why do you think the English stars flee to Switzerland that way? Not just tax, I'm not saying that. <laughs> because it's very beautiful. Uh, we visited Switzerland for a vacation about 16 years ago and fell in love with the place that we were 
staying, and we bought a holiday home there. And uh, it was only later that we decided we'd like to live there permanently. Now, tell me about your family. You have... It's a very complicated family. You have a daughter <laughs> from your first marriage. Well, it's, well, it's very simple. All you have to do is say that I ha we have his, you and mine, and ours, yes. So you have uh, one daughter, though, from your first marriage. Mm -hmm. And that's Emma, is that Yes, Emma? and she's yes. 20 years old. Uh, you have two stepchildren from Blake's first marriage. Right, and they're older than Emma. Are they boys or girls? Uh, there's, it's a, boy, a girl and a boy. Jenny uh, is, I think, 26, and Jeff is 23. And now you have two adopted children, mm -hmm. Vietnamese orphans. Yes. Are they both girls? I know one is Amy. One is Amy and the other is Joanna. They're both girls. Now, that is complicated. How do you <laughs> integrate those people into a family mm -hmm. unit? Because your family is terribly important well, to you. First of all, you have to ask the older children whether they would mind your adopting children. And uh, to, my, to all the children's credit, they were exceedingly generous. Um, they, they thought about it and they just gave us the the, the, the wonderful go-ahead to go do it. So we did it as a family, and uh, it isn't such a hard thing to do. I, I was more frightened before than I ever was after, because it is, it is just the doing that, that's fearful. Afterwards, um, you just take it a step at a time. Were you frightened before because you have the chance of saying, no, it's not like having your own um, baby where I wasn't nature sure. is going to take yeah, its course. I wasn't course. sure what cultural things or problems I might get into since the children did come from Vietnam and since I had never adopted before I wasn't sure if I would run into any problems. I can only tell you that I, I don't even think of the children as being adopted. Uh, that all one's instincts just respond anyway and uh, they really are just our family now. Uh, it is only fear itself that you have to fear at the beginning. What was the driving motivation that made you want to adopt these children? Uh, very simple. I wanted children and so did Blake and we weren't getting successful ourselves and so uh, I thought that it would be wise to adopt and so did Blake. And we adopted the one thinking perhaps that we would adopt in a couple of years another child to uh, grow up alongside the first one and then our source, our, the orphanage that we adopted from, was in Saigon, and that Saigon mm. began to topple at the end of the war. But you, did you adopt Vietnamese orphans because there were no available babies in America, or was it some amorphous guilt left over from the American war? I don't what? think it was that. I think it was uh, any child that, that crossed our vision would have been just fine. But um, uh, we knew of this agency, and we also knew that it was quite a quick adoption, and we were anxious to do it. And uh, I think an adoption, as a rule, takes about two years. And in this instance, uh, the first one took about 11 months, and the second one took two months because Saigon toppled and they sent a baby to us quickly. Do they travel with you now? How yes. How old are they now? They're eight and nine. And uh, I, I adopted Amy when she was five months old and Joanna when she was two months old. And I don't know where the eight years disappeared to. It's been so fast. Now, since then, you've become involved with um, raising money for a charity for Cambodia and Vietnam? Or what was it before you became involved or after the adoption? I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't even first? remember. I, actually, the, the organization that Blake and I try to raise funds for is an international organization, and it happens to work uh, a great mm. deal in Southeast Asia, but it also does but enormous you, work You've actually elsewhere. toured and um, gone, undergone some hardships for it. I'd, I went to see for myself. Um, because Amy and Joe uh, come from Vietnam, I wanted to see for myself and when this agency that we support which is called Operation California and is based in Los Angeles although it's an international relief agency when they were making a trip to Vietnam and uh, Cambodia and Thailand I went along with them on one of their trips just to see for myself mm -hmm. it's if I'm going to be a spokeswoman for them it seemed very wise to be able to speak with authority about the subject rather than just spouting things that I had read in the newspaper and when you saw what you saw that must have changed you a great deal. I think it did. It, 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 uh, I don't, you could say anything you like. It devastated me. It stood me on my head. It changed my life. It, it certainly put an enormous amount of my life into proportion uh, because the things that I saw were not pleasant and people really are hurting over there. <laughs> the humanitarian problems are unbelievable. I'd never been to a third world country before, so for me it was quite a shock. 
Does it make you a little impatient with the rest of us who complain about a late bus or something like that? What I think makes me impatient a little bit is that I, I wonder when the world is going to start looking upon itself as a large family rather than dealing with isolated countries. Uh, I, I know it's a dream and a vision, but it's got to happen one of these days. And there's no, unfortunately, I don't think in spite of that statement, there's no real global solution. I think people should do what they can, where they can, for whom they can. You know, it strikes me that you have an enormous amount of energy. We've talked about your discipline. Um, is that just a facade, something that's been built up over the years? Or is this really you? No, I think I am blessed with some energy, uh, and a lot of it. But I've also learned how to pace myself and to take care of myself since How I... do you look after yourself? Because well, here you've been working so hard for the last three days. I know you were up at 5.30 yesterday. 4.30 yesterday. 4.30. That's no way to treat a star. <laughs> no, uh, listen, it was one day. That's no big deal. Um, I exercise. I eat sensibly. Um, and I try to rest as much as I can, when I can. What, what would be your very ideal day? If, mm. some, if some Mary Poppins came down and said, well, Julie Andrews, you can have an ideal day. It, it would encompass so many things, uh, and it would depend on the kind of ideal I was feeling like. Uh, an ideal day would be to sing with a wonderful orchestra and have the freedom of experimenting and playing with it. Uh, another ideal day would be to be in the country with the kids and perhaps go to a wonderful, see a wonderful ballet company in the evening, something like that. That would be a relaxing ideal day. Uh, I can think of many others. So you would have not an ideal day, but an ideal week? Oh, I, yes. I, the, the, I have a lot of days that I could <laughs> suggest making ideal. <laughs> Is there anyone in this world that you envy? No, I don't think so. Uh, I may envy a quality in somebody that I wish I had, or something like that, but perhaps as I'm getting older, I realize that if I really want something, it's up to me to do something mm. about it. And I really don't envy anybody. Why should I? I mean, I've had so very much. Mm -hmm. So to what moment in your life, what quirk of fate or haphazard happening would you put down the moment that set you on to this very enviable road? There have been a series of phenomenal uh, pieces of good luck in my life. Uh, they've passed my way at exactly the right time, and I happen to be there to be able to, to, to uh, pick up on them. But I don't think, other than those wonderful moments of timing, which of course contributed a lot, I think it's just a whole mass of things that have contributed to this. If it hadn't been for the early work and the discipline, I might not have been ready uh, when the other things came along. It's hard to say. I know that going to America for me uh, was an enormous big stepping stone to, to broadening my, my, my horizons in work and in my life and everything. Well, I'm very glad that you happen to be in England <laughs> for this interview. Thank so you very I. much. Thank you, Julie Andrews. Thank you. And uh, while we listen to Love Me Tender and the uh, lower voice belongs to Mr. Johnny Cash from your new record, let me remind all of you watching that A-plus will be back again tomorrow at 2 and we'll be talking to the singer Elizabeth Welsh and holding the finals of the special competition we've been running with TV Times. Do join us then. Goodbye. Love me tender, love, love me true. true. All, all my dreams fulfilled. Mama, darling, I love you, and I always will.